Hi, I'm Pastor Kent. Welcome to the worship experience from the First United Methodist Church of Normal, Illinois. We're so glad that you're with us to worship together today. Speaking of welcome, we're going to be talking about welcoming during the sermon time today. Our scripture is from Matthew 25, the scripture of the final judgment, that parable. It's interesting to think about what God is saying to us through, uh, through those words. But then I'm also going to be talking about some people that Jesus welcomed. And, and why did he welcome the people he did? What does it mean for us to follow in Jesus' footsteps and his example? So it is a good day. I'm glad we had this chance to be together. Let's worship God. Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope can enter in to be the hands of healing and to plant seed of peace, singing welcome, welcome to this place, you're invited to come and know God's grace, for a welcome, the love of God to share, cause all of us are welcome here. All are welcome in this place. Let's talk together of a time when we will share a feast where pride and power need to serve the lonely and the least. Enjoy us at the table as we join our hands to pray, singing welcome, welcome to this place. You're invited to come and know God's grace, all the welcome, the love of God to share. Cause all of us are welcome here All are welcome in this place Let's dream together of the day When earth and heaven are one a city built of love and light, the new Jerusalem, where our morning turns to dancing, every creature lifts its voice, crying, welcome, welcome to this place, you're in to come and know God's grace or a welcome to love of God to share cause all of us are welcome here all are welcome in this Hi friends, I am Miss Pam, the Director of Children's Ministry here at Normal First. Welcome, I'm so glad you're here. Our big idea today is God teaches us how to lead. I've had some great leaders in my time and I've had some not so great leaders in my time. We talked about some of the characteristics for great leaders in Sunday school and the kids gave us some incredible answers. Um, selflessness, wisdom, connection. I was really surprised with the thoughtfulness that they gave us for these leaders. 
It was really incredible. Can you think of some characteristics of the great leaders in your life? We are going to take an exodus expedition this month. God's people, the Israelites, were being treated very poorly in Egypt. The king had gotten a little bit scared about how populous the Israelites had grown. And so he passed a law that threatened the very lives of the baby boys. And it was pretty scary. He meant to hurt them. We're going to learn a little bit more about what one mother did to keep her baby boy safe. And I'm sure you probably know the answer to that question. She floated her baby boy in a basket made of reeds, and he was rescued. And I bet you can guess where we're going with this. That baby boy grew up to be a great leader of his people, too. Exodus is filled with some amazing stories of adventure. We're going to learn how God used a burning bush to deliver a message. And we're going to see how God used a man who had trouble speaking to become a great leader. We're going to learn how Moses led his people. And I hope that along the way, we learn more about how God teaches us to be great leaders. Let's pray. God, help me to learn how you are teaching and preparing me to be a leader everywhere I go. Thank you for the people in my life who lead me with love, wisdom, and grace. Amen. Please join me in today's scripture reading, which comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, and, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer him, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in person, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternity into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So on his way from the Galilee region to Jericho, Jesus was on this journey toward Jerusalem. 
to the place where he would be arrested and crucified. The citizens of Jericho, where he would be passing through, heard that he was coming. So they came out to greet Jesus and the disciples and his friends that were traveling with him. This is what they did in that day and time. They would hear somebody important was coming. And at this point, Jesus was getting a lot of, a lot of uh, fame for all the things that he had been doing. They knew that he was some kind of special person, some kind of special prophet. So the people from Jericho went out to greet Jesus on the way. This is the way the Gospel of Luke tells the story. And they walked with him. And as they approached the town, I can picture you know, all, the, all the important people, the, the business people, the, the wealthy of the town, the political leaders, the, whatever the mayor was. Uh, they were there. And they began to hear yelling. Now imagine that you're trying to make a good impression on someone and you go out to, to greet them and you're walking into your house or into your town and somebody starts yelling. Uh, it'd be a little awkward, a little embarrassing. So the people tell, there tell this guy who's yelling to, to shut up, you know, be quiet. But he, he, he doesn't uh, listen to them. Actually, he even gets louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, he yelled. So what does Jesus do? Now, Jesus can hear the people telling this man to be quiet, I assume. He might be tempted to go along with the people, kind of like uh, not pay attention, pretend he doesn't notice this disturbance. But he does the opposite. He tells these people who have been telling this uh, blind beggar to be quiet, he tells them, bring this man to me. Now, the Gospel of Mark tells us that this man is named Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus. And some people suggest that Bartimaeus literally means son of filth. Filth? How's that for a name? Uh, so that may give you a little bit of an idea of the status of this person, blind Bartimaeus. He's blind, so he sits at the outskirts of the, of the village of the city of Jericho begging, and that's how he, he survives. He comes, they, they bring this, this blind Bartimaeus to Jesus, and Jesus says, ask him kind of an interesting question. What do you want from me? Well, isn't it obvious? Well, not always. Jesus asks, I think Jesus asks you and I the same question sometimes. What do you want from me? Blind Bartimaeus says, I want to recover my sight. Will you give me back my sight? And so Jesus says to him, your faith is what's made you heal well. And he, he does. He heals him. His sight is returned. And blind Bartimaeus then begins to walk with Jesus and follow him. So that Jesus and blind Bartimaeus and the disciples and the friend, everybody is, is kind of walking kind of like this parade into Jericho. And I'm assuming there's some excitement. I'm assuming the important people in town have already decided that they're going to have a banquet for Jesus and whose house that's going to be in. And people have probably been working hard, getting food ready. Uh, somebody's probably decided where they're going to invite Jesus to spend the night, who's, whose house is best for that, and how they can really treat Jesus well. So they'll have a good feeling about Jericho. But you know what Jesus does? He walks through the village of Jericho. It, it appears that he's not planning on stopping at all, and actually he, he, he walks all the way through and is walking out of the village of Jericho. But, but uh, the Gospel of Luke tells us something happens. He talks about Zacchaeus. Now, if you went to vacation Bible school like I did, you grew up singing Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. Um, that's this Zacchaeus, the short Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, we're told. And we're told that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, but he can't see him through the crowds. So he runs ahead of Jesus, climbs a sycamore tree, which would have been outside of the city limits, and, and there waits to see Jesus. Uh, now, there are a couple of things uh, that don't make sense here. One is, in that culture, adults don't run. It's considered undignified to run in public. Another thing adults don't do, it'd be very embarrassing to be caught climbing a tree if you're an adult. Um, you might have your servant climb a tree for some reason. You might have your kids climb a tree, but adults didn't climb trees. So Zacchaeus runs ahead and climbs the sycamore tree, this leafy tree where he can be hidden and watch. What's going on here? Well, we're told that Zacchaeus is short, so he probably couldn't see through the crowds. Um, 
Usually, if you're a wealthy man, like we're told Zacchaeus is, the crowds would pardon. They would make a special place for you up front because they would know your status in the community. Not so for Zacchaeus. Why? Well, he's a tax collector. He's, he's a collaborator. He's working for the Roman occupiers. And he's stealing money. He's, he's, he's not only implementing the crushing tax of the Romans, but he's also uh, getting even more than that for himself. That's how he's become wealthy. I imagine that one of the reasons Zacchaeus isn't in the crowd is because uh, it wouldn't be safe for him. You know, if he's surrounded by crowds, someone could easily stick a knife in his back, and, and a lot of people would want to. So the crowds march outside the city of Jericho. Jesus stops, looks up, sees Zacchaeus in the tree. Um, at this point, I'm assuming people are ridiculing Zacchaeus. Uh, people are, are taunting him. I mean, look at this short man in this tree. But Jesus doesn't go along with the crowds. Once again, he upsets their expectations of what they think is going to happen. And he calls Zacchaeus to come down. He says, I'm going to go to your house. I'm going to eat with you, and I'm going to stay with you. Now, both of those things in that culture would have been a, a real sign of, of commitment to, for Jesus. I mean, if you eat with someone in that culture, it's a big deal. You become like family for a while. You have responsibility for each other. You're kind of endorsing them. If you spend the night with someone, that's another commitment. That's a big deal. You're saying something about who this person is to you and your relationship. So what Jesus does then is he takes the, this animosity and anger towards Zacchaeus and puts himself where he's going to be the target of people's disappointment and possibly people's anger. Um, so Jesus is here not staying with our kind of people, but with a tax collector, a collaborator, a sinful person. I can imagine it was a big deal. So I ask you, who does God call you to welcome? Who should you be eating with or staying with? Who should we be welcoming to the church? Who should we be inviting? You know, when I was in uh, seminary, a few years younger than I am now, we were in Atlanta, Georgia. I worked as a youth minister at a church outside of Atlanta. And uh, the, the minister there, um, a really smart guy, very successful pastor, he came and he announced to the staff, we're going to have a new evangelism program. And he, I don't remember the exact name, but something like Affinity Evangelism. Affinity Evangelism. And this was the concept that we were going to encourage all the church people to invite people like them to come to church, the affinity. Um, so we were going to encourage them to think about who their neighbors were that lived, lived in the same neighborhood with them. Uh, we were going to think about who they worked with that was kind of on the, the same rung of the ladder uh, that they worked with to invite those people to church. Um, invite people that you have a lot in common with to come to church. That should be the focus. Now, this concept had proven to be effective in growing churches in other places. And so that's why the pastor was bringing it to us. And I assumed it would probably be successful there. The idea was that people like you would be a good fit with the church you were at. They would already have a lot in common with the other people there. And they would be more likely to come and they would be more likely to stick, to stay around, if they felt like they were around people like them. So... I ask you, does this sound like a good idea? Is this the kind of welcoming that we're supposed to do? It kind of makes sense that there's part of me that really likes this idea. There's just this little nagging problem for me, though. It doesn't feel to me like what Jesus did or what Jesus teaches us to do. What do you think? I mean, did Jesus try to create groups that were just alike? You know, let's get all the same kind of people together and, and you be one church and you be another church? Or did Jesus invite a whole variety of people and call them into community with each other and say, you know, from now on, it's no longer uh, free and slave. There's no longer, um, you know, Jewish and Greek, uh, Gentile. That it's all God's children trying to figure out how to live together in God's will. Should we segregate, our, segregate ourselves by our economic class, or our education level, or race, or, or gender, or sexual orientation? 
Is that what the body of Christ is supposed to be like? And why should we invite others anyway? I mean, don't they know we're here? If they want to come and be part of the church, surely they can. Are they even interested? What's so important about receiving an invitation? Well, maybe if we did focus on affinity evangelism and just invite people like us, it might be a little less complicated. Has anyone else noticed that diversity is complicated? I mean, sometimes it's hard enough to get along with people who are a lot like you, much less people who grew up in in different ways, in different places, that people who tend to, to think or act differently than what we're used to. That can add another layer of complexity. You have to work to understand each other and to allow room for differences and different preferences. And let's face it, people who are different can just downright annoy us sometimes, right? I remember years ago, early in my ministry, I had a mentor who who gave me some advice. He said something like this, as you work in churches, there are going to be times when people will annoy you. I know, it's hard to believe, right? There will be times that people annoy you. And you'll have trouble being patient with these people. In those times, he advised, Just think about how frustrating you must be to God sometimes. Think about all the ways that you don't respond as God wants you to respond. And then think about how patient God is with you. God doesn't give up on you. God doesn't dismiss you. God continues to invite you and welcome you and love you. If God can be that patient with you, Surely you can have a little patience for the people that you're around and working with. It was good advice. You know, I am convinced right now that there's a crisis in our nation and in our world. We are facing a crisis. We're we're living in times where there's rapid change going on. Institutions are, are breaking down. Many people are angry and lost. Many people are struggling. I think one of the most important cures to what ails our society, our community, is to build community. Not just surface community. People that we can complain to on social media or places where we get to hear people say the things that we already believe to be true, but real relationships where we get to know people in a deep way. I think the church is one of the best places for community, that kind of community, caring community, can be built and can be a solution to some of the crises that we're dealing with currently. And I think Christ models that for us. The church, with all of its flaws, and we we know a lot of them, has throughout history been a place where people can come together and work together despite their differences and overcome those differences. In order for the church to be this kind of community, people like you and me have to create it. You and I have to reach out to others, to welcome others, and to create a caring community, a safe community for each other. So whose job is it to be welcoming? It's easy to come into a place like this and feel a little insecure. It's easy to walk into a church and think, well, somebody here should be doing something to make me feel more comfortable. Somebody should be welcoming me. Somebody should be speaking to me. To help me. But in the church, it's everybody's job to be welcoming, isn't it? Instead of sitting back, we're called to walk in and to be caring ourselves. What if instead of waiting for someone else, what if we're the people that we're waiting for? What can you do to reach out to welcome others? Even if you haven't been around that long yourself. What if each of us pushed ourselves just a little bit out of our comfort zones? What if it's everybody's job to be welcoming? So let me close with this. Off the top of my head, I can think of five things that we each could do to welcome others and to help build a community, especially in this church. Number one, push yourself to say hello. Maybe even smile. Introduce yourself. Maybe even wear a name tag to help others get to know you. Push yourself to say hello. Number two, invite someone in the church 
to get together for a coffee or for lunch or dinner or to come over to your house. Give yourself a chance to get to know another person better. Number three, look for some group or some event in the life of the church and then show up and show up to get to know other people. Put yourself in a place where you can know people outside of just when you come for worship. Number four, when you see someone who looks or acts differently, let that be a source of curiosity for you. Think to yourself, what is it that God wants me to learn from this person? How can I understand them better? And finally, pray. Pray that as a church community, we will be faithful to the vision of Jesus Christ. Why do we welcome others? We welcome others because God welcomes us and because we follow Jesus Christ, the life, the teachings, the example of Jesus Christ. So remember, whenever you do it, unto the least of these, you do it for Jesus Christ himself. Amen. It's good that we can pray together. I pray for you today. I hope you pray for me and for others. Let's take our prayers and go to God. Let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for your presence, even in mysterious ways. We trust that you hear our prayers and know our needs. God, we live in a world of plenty in which the poor struggle for daily bread. We pray for those who lack the basic necessities of life. God, we give thanks for those who willingly share the resources you have given to us. Correct those who hoard resources out of anxiety or ignorance or selfishness. And God, forgive us when we are those persons. Open our eyes to your presence among the poor of the world and free all of us for joyful giving and sharing. God, you admonish us you admonish us to offer hospitality to the stranger, to welcome the weary. We pray for travelers today, for those who immigrate to new lands, for refugees of political and religious wars, for those who have no place to call home. Bless those who offer refuge to the wayfaring stranger. Convict, convict the conscience and open the heart of any who would raise walls of self-preservation and isolation for the stranger, for those who minister to them, and for those who would refuse them. Compassionate Lord, hear our prayer. God, you hear the cries of all who are in distress. Heal those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Comfort them in their need and help those who care for them. God, we pray for the caregivers. We also pray for those who abandon the sick and suffering out of fear. Teach us to serve our sisters and brothers and to share the burdens together of disease of body, mind, and heart. For the sick and those in distress, for those who care for them, and those who are afraid to offer fellowship to them, compassionate Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, confirm our prayer as we dedicate ourselves to live as disciples of Jesus Christ, as we pray the prayer he teaches to us, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It is a, a, a pleasure and a joy to be able to have enough to give and share with others. 
God, help us to be generous. Help us to be faithful to you as we give of our offerings in all the various ways that we can do that. Our money, our time, our talent. Amen.
It is great to worship with you as always. Thanks for being part of this worship together. As we go out into this next week, whatever it brings, know that God welcomes you. God will be continuing to invite you to love you. And God will give you a chance to welcome others. Thanks be to God. See you soon. Amen. Welcome in this place.